uh, let's start this straight away. Uh, thank you, Tayaba, for for giving us time, and uh, it's an honor for us uh, for you to be here. Uh, just a brief introduction. Uh, Tayaba is currently working as a head of investment in one of the leading financial institutions in Pakistan. Um, he she has been working as a head of investment banking with a history of uh, uh, relevant history industry background. So. Uh, she has largely been working in the project financing, so she has been involving uh, Sukuk issuances, syndications, credit analysis, uh, Islamic finance especially. Uh, she has all sort of degrees, so uh, uh, she has uh, mashallah, a degree in uh, an MBA from IBA, then she also qualified as a, as a financial risk manager and she's also a uh, CFA charter holder. So I think uh, Awaz has introduced me uh, uh, with generosity. Just briefly touch upon uh, my career journey. I have been associated with the banking industry for about 18 years now and primarily looking at uh, investment banking side of commercial banking. And within investment banking, uh, because commercial banks mainly deal in, you know, debt related uh, matters. So within commercial banking, it is uh, project finance and debt capital markets, which has been my forte. And uh, Islamic banking, you know, structuring. So uh, since last 12 years, I've actually been uh, focusing on deals, uh, which were infrastructure deals, for example, port deals, renewable energy uh, focus deals, IPPs, solar uh, IPPs, wind IPPs. So <clears throat> basically um, that, that has been uh, the focus, the center, uh, center piece of uh, you know, my, my basic work, my main work, apart from investment banking, I sit on a couple of boards. Uh, the five listed companies on whose board I'm serving as an independent director. And uh, also uh, I uh, teach at IBS visiting faculty. Um, so sometimes I join them uh, as visiting faculty. So this is my brief background. Coming to the subject which I've chosen for you guys, because this is mastering FRM platform. And FRM is of course all about risk, uh, risk management, uh, risk analysis. So we thought, uh, Avas and I thought it would be appropriate to uh, select a topic which would kind of align with the, you know, the basic theme of the platform. So the topic is risk management in project finance and more so with a focus on renewable energy. Renewable energy, I mean, I think we all know is a buzzword these days. Uh, globally, uh, countries are converting their energy generation from fossil fuel to renewable. Um, a lot of wind farms have already been put up. Um, uh, most of the European countries have already uh, converted themselves onto solar. So their major energy requirements are being fed through, through renewable sources, which are mainly uh, solar and wind. So it is a buzzword and I think it will continue to be the case because um, I mean, uh, as you know, concerns regarding climatic changes uh, further intensify as responsible banking principles of responsible banking and you know the uh, sustainable development goals uh, from UN which have to be met by 2030. Is all of this kind of converge? I think renewable energy and responsible banking, which kind of go hand in hand. Um, they obviously will become more important uh, to understand, more uh, valuable to know about. So topic is uh, um, project uh, risk in uh, project finance and with a particular focus on renewable energy, which is essentially the independent power producers, the IPPs uh, that, we, uh, that we talk about. So I'm, going to share my screen. There's a small presentation I've prepared. Okay. So can you see? So we are starting off. Uh, so this is my profile. I've already spoken about myself. Uh, I think I don't need to dwell on this any further. Let's start away right away on the topic. Okay. So as I said that uh, the topic 
focuses on project finance broadly. And within project finance, we are covering, trying to cover the niche of uh, renewable energy today. So the first slide is relating to critical stakeholders in project finance. So before we move on uh, to discuss the topic in detail, it's important to understand as to who are the stakeholders in, in project finance, in a project finance transaction, who are the stakeholders? And in fact, I feel before I move on to talk about stakeholders in project finance, let me go a little back, let me step back a bit and let me tell you the difference between corporate finance and project finance transaction. Those of you who are, who are here from the, from the finance background maybe already are aware of the difference, but maybe some of you need to refresh it. So essentially a corporate finance transaction is, uh, is basically a transaction which is being done on an existing balance sheet. So you have an existing balance sheet, you have an existing company, existing setup, existing financials, ex existing either a service-based setup, which is already existing, functioning, or you have a manufacturing-based setup, you know, the, the factory is there, the production is, is there, the numbers are there, so the cash flows are there. So you have, you have a balance sheet and on that balance sheet, you, you try to expand, uh, for example, if the cement company and if um, the sponsor or the company wants to add an additional line to that company, that will primarily be a corporate finance transaction because the numbers are already there to support some additional borrowing, some additional debt. Uh, so it's a corporate finance transaction because you're lending to an existing setup, an existing company. When we say project finance, we typically mean that it's a, it's a, it's a greenfield project it's a it's a greenfield thing. Uh, the project does not exist. Uh, there's no company which is in existence at at the moment. And naturally, if the company doesn't exist, that also means that there are no cash flows. There's actually nothing. So so project finance typically means that you're starting from scratch. Uh, so keeping that this background in mind, we now need to understand how it all flows. You know how it all works out. So basically, um, <clears throat> most of the project finance around the globe happens uh, uh, with you know set of critical critical group, uh, critical stakeholders that we call, and lenders who are the financiers are of paramount importance. Why? Because why is that? Uh, it the reason prim primary reason for lenders being at the center point, lenders being the focal point of the whole. Uh, project finance structure is basically uh, the fact that lenders are, mo in most of the project finance transaction, lenders are actually dishing out a heavy chunk of finance, um, or, or in other words, they're funding a heavy chunk of the project cost. So for example, for example, if the project cost say is 10 billion rupees, let's talk about in rupees, I think most of us here are from uh, Pakistan. So let's talk, talk in rupees. So for example, if the project cost is 10 billion rupees, so typically in a project finance transaction, lenders will be lending as much as 80% of the project cost. So, so if, you, if as lender, we are giving 80% of the cost, that means we are taking like, you know, we are taking main risk. We are assuming principal risk ourselves. So 80% of the risk obviously is lying with the lenders. So in that sense, lenders obviously are very, very important stakeholder. Then uh, what kind of lenders could be there? The, the second point on the slide is actually discussing the types of the lenders, who, who could be the lenders. So if, again, uh, with the perspective of Pakistani market, it could be one of the group of lenders could be local commercial banks, which is like, for example, HBL, UBL, MCB and all the commercial banks which are there in the market, FPL, all the commercial banks which are there. The second group of lenders could be multilaterals. Multilaterals are institutions who are global institutions and who work with the mandate of development of uh, the progressive countries, of developing countries rather. For example, IFC, IFC, IF, one of the uh, uh, division in IFC has the mandate to actually lend in developing countries and in particular, lend uh, with focus on projects uh, which are going to add value to the society, environmentally friendly projects and uh, social, socially uh, viable projects or uh, uh, projects which add value uh, to human life. 
uh, projects which obviously uh, add value to, um, to, to, to the quality of life, for example, infrastructure projects. So multilaterals, IFC, CDC, which is a London-based bank, FMO, which is a Netherlands-based bank. Um, um, so those are the multilaterals, ADB, IDB, you can all count them all as multilaterals. Uh, which are there and which actually very actively lend in Pakistani market. So multilaterals are very active in Pakistani market and especially in renewable energy uh, space, they're very much there, they're active, they're there in uh, infrastructure financing. I mean, they're there in port financing also, in roads also, some of the multilaterals are exclusively lending to government of Pakistan in forms of grant and in some in form of re -lent loans. So they are very active in Pakistani market. Foreign commercial banks are there. Foreign commercial banks, I think, uh, in my view, they are, their presence is limited because uh, they are usually uh, giving, you know, like FI lines. They're not taking credit risk on the project. They are mostly giving liquidity to commercial banks who then use that liquidity to, uh, to basically pay a dollar portion of the cost. So their, their presence is limited. Export credit agency's presence is also limited. Export credit agency basically means that when, um, if you are sourcing, for example, uh, some, some uh, machinery from a German country uh, or say from a European country, so the export uh, credit is given. Um, you can buy the machinery and pay. Uh, and and there's this, basically there's this company which steps in, which pays to the supplier of the machinery and which lends you uh, the credit, which is basically the state-owned um, entity of that country from where the machinery was sourced uh, by your borrower in this country. So they give you a credit line, which is obviously a very long-term credit line. And this is a very cheap source of funding. But again, uh, this used to be one of the very frequently used uh, source of financing, but not any longer. Um, it's not readily available. And I think the conditions attached with export credit are now very strict and stringent. So for that reason, uh, this is again, not very commonly used these days, these days, it used to be a very favorite, uh, source of funding in the past, uh, back some 10, 15 years ago, uh, political insurance providers, their, uh, contribution comes in, uh, uh, very handy when we talk about Chinese lenders. So Chinese lenders are. I mean, their presence is actually uh, completely uh, unavoidable and important when it comes to big CPAC projects. So for example, the CPAC project, uh, I'll give you just one example, uh, the coal energy projects basically, which are not renewable energy, that's fossil fuel coal energy projects. So coal energy projects, they're humongous, they're very large, for example, 1320 megawatt. So it's a big number and the cost runs in billions of I mean, literally the cost runs in, in, in billions of dollars. So it is impossible for local commercial banks to uh, lend money to such projects. Even a 330 megawatt coal power project, like it's, a, it's a, not such a big size, 330 megawatt coal power project. Even for such a project, uh, the total lending requirement is north of, uh, in, in USD terms, it is about um, uh, let me convert it in PKR terms for you. So in PKR terms, it is, it is more than 130 billion rupees. Um, it will, like, you know, putting together all the long-term facilities, 130 billion rupees is a very big number. So a portion of this number, uh, is sourced through local commercial banks. And most of this, this bulk of, you know, the debt comes from Chinese lenders. So when Chinese lenders come in Pakistani market, one of their core requirement is the political insurance, uh, which is a uh, Sinusure, which we basically name as Sinusure. Uh, so basically the Sinusure uh, is, the, is the, the agency which provides political insurance to Chinese lenders. It is based out of China. The political insurance that Chinese lenders demand is very, very expensive. And, uh, but this is their requirement. And as I said, that since the projects are so big in size and their funding requirements are so huge that it's unavoidable uh, do not bring in Chinese lenders. And one of, one of the other angle to this is basically uh, in coal projects, for example, the multilaterals do not come in. They do not come in because of the environmental concerns. So you, we, we are left with no choice but to engage with Chinese banks for putting up such projects. So that is why uh, the political insurance providers also become critical and their funding cost, which is, like I said, very high, 7%. Is basically the premium, um, the annual premium that they charge. So naturally, this is high premium, um, <clears throat> but still, 
they obviously are taken on board. So moving on to the next point is typical financing structures. Okay, that also is very important to understand non-recourse, limited recourse financing. Most of the project financing uh, in its true sense is actually either non-recourse or limited recourse. By the word non-recourse, we mean that uh, the borrower, the lenders have no access to any other source of income except the project, project cash flows itself. So uh, the borrower only has uh, like, you know, the fallback for borrower is just the project itself. So if the project is not put up in a proper manner, is not structured efficiently, properly, uh, then that means the lender is bound to fail and the, the project is bound to default. And obviously the money which was given to project is down the drain. So non-recourse is the highest risk category and uh, the allocation of risk and non-recourse has to be very careful and obviously has to be very methodical as well. Limited recourse financing usually means that uh, lenders have a certain degree, certain pool, a certain ex, you know, certain pool available for fallback in case project cash flows are not up to the mark, in case project is not performing uh, as per you know the financial model uh, which was set out at the beginning. And in, in, in that event, you, there is some some comfort, some security, some, you know, some limited security, which is there, which lenders can have access to in, in, in such an event. And so, so essentially project financing is either non-recourse or limited recourse. Limited recourse also means that till project is completed, like construction of project is completed till, till such time, uh, lenders have access to, for example, a sponsor support, uh, from the sponsor in the event, there are cost overruns, like, you know, there are, um, for example, the cost was supposed to be 110 um, uh, billion rupees, but because of unforeseen circumstances, it went up to 12 billion rupees. So, so, so sponsor is obligated to put in another 2 billion rupees. So that is like limited recourse access to uh, sponsor's support in during, uh, during, you know, construction phase. So that also comes and falls in under limited recourse financing category. On the other hand, full recourse financing is not relevant to project finance as such, but I think it was important to, uh, to, to mention the term here. Full recourse financing basically means that, you know, uh, you have access to uh, like, you know, another uh, balance sheet, some other cash flow. So you, you, your risk is covered. You are not dependent upon the project cash flows only. You have something else also, maybe some other company's cash flows, some other company's security. And it, it, then obviously it is not that risky and you may be uh, less stringent with your conditions. Uh, lending, the next um, topic, the next point on the slide is lending advisors and decision makers. Remember, we are talking about, we are discussing stakeholders in project financing. And within stakeholders, we've discussed the structure, we have discussed the type of lenders. Now we are talking about lending advisors and decision makers. As I said, that lenders are like, you know, dishing out a heavy, a, a major chunk of the project cost. Um, so naturally, and, and at the same time, it's like, you know, project financing. So you are you are trying to build something from scratch. Uh, some of the projects are like completely new. For example, imagine when the first wind IPP was uh, like, you know, was introduced to, to the world and the lenders who would have been part of the first ever wind IPP, uh, when, wherever it was um, put up. So imagine um, how difficult it would have been, for example, for them, any, any first ever project, for any, any dam for that matter, any road for that matter. So any first ever project is obviously the most difficult. So once you have had a template built up, then it becomes a bit easy, but it's still obviously each site is dynamic. Each, each project is dynamic in its own sense. Uh, but the first ever's are obviously the most challenging ones. So then who, who becomes uh, very relevant in such situations and project mm -hmm. finance situations? Lenders obviously are not expert in technical matters. Lenders wouldn't know, uh, for example, the speed of wind. They wouldn't understand how a turbine would technically function. They wouldn't know how what, what a gearbox would do or would not do and which quality is good and which is not. So lenders all over the world for project financing rely heavily on advisors. They rely on, on advisors. 
So, and advisors, there are different categories of advisors that they rely on. And this is actually, uh, this is actually common across the globe. So it is not just in Pakistan, you would find this common across the globe in all countries, wherever project financing is done, this is something very, very common. So we have got technical advisors who are obviously, I mean, as the name suggests, they specialize in technical aspects. They spe specialize in engineering aspect. They specialize in efficiency aspect of the whole project setup uh, with, uh, with, you know, main focus on technical aspects of the whole, whole machinery, the plant itself. They, they talk, they discuss in their reports, they discuss uh, the, the cost comparison, they give us the cost comparison of, for example, this type of technology versus some other type of technology, whether the cost is in line, uh, you know, with the, um, uh, whether the cost is in line with the type of technology which is being offered. So these advisors actually do proper in-depth due diligence and they submit reports to lenders. And technical advisors are, are very, very important because their engagement continues till the project has commissioned. So till the time the project has actually uh, commissioned itself, which commission, project has commissioned means that project has started like operating and churning revenue. So till that point in time where project has started uh, generating revenue, till that point in time, the technical advisor would be engaged. They would periodically monitor the progress of construction. They would report to the lenders. Uh, on periodical basis, monthly basis, for example, or in some cases, bi-monthly basis, or in some cases, even quarterly basis. So um, they, uh, they, they submit report and on, on the basis of their feedback, lenders continue to allow drawdowns. In other words, lenders continue to allow funding to the project based on construction milestones being achieved. So, 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 so please understand that lenders do not lend in, in, in these instances, lenders do not uh, give the entire 80% of the project cost in one go. It, that's, that's not how lending is done in project financing. In project financing, lending is programmed. So you are only giving uh, money to the extent the construction of the project is completed. So as the, as the project is, uh, you know, going forward and as the project is um, achieving its milestones, the funding is also flowing in, in tandem with its construction uh, progress. Financial advisors are typically banks um, who actually structure the whole deal uh, and who are aware of the financial matters uh, as to you know what the security should be, as to um, what should the tenor of the loan be. So, the de so they essentially work on financial model in detail exhaustively. And based on financial model, they come up with a structure for the project, which they then sell to other lenders uh, so that there are, there are enough lenders. And I think one important thing that I uh, did not touch upon is that obviously when uh, project financing is, is like huge money out of the window. So it's not one single bank. Typically there are like three, four banks together who do one project, even, even more, uh, you know, larger group of banks. So it's, banks working together on a project. So it's like a group of banks working together on a project. So it could be a group of four foreign banks, a group of local banks, or a group of both together working on a, on a, on a project. So, so one of them will be financial advisor who would have, for example, structured the whole transaction um, for the benefit of all other lenders. Uh, insurance advisors, insurance is again very, very important for such projects because and there are comprehensive insurance programs which are bought, they're not normal insurance. So, so there's insurance of, uh, you know, um, like delay in a startup, for example, and loss in profit. So, so th these are comprehensive insurance policies which are there. And for that reason, insurance advisors are also engaged. Legal advisors, as the name suggests, lawyers, uh, when there are multilaterals involved in a transaction, the foreign lawyers are, of course, like they are there, they're very, they are, I mean, uh, they are, their presence is like, you know, essential because foreign uh, lenders and or multilaterals or foreign commercial banks obviously do not work with local lenders. So why? Because their documents, the loan documents are spelled out in, in, in English law governed uh, modules. So English law governed documents means that you have to have a council which is uh, expert in English law. Obviously local councils are not expert in English law. They're expert in Pakistani law. 
so uh, legal advisors again depending upon who the lenders are legal advisors could be from different countries uh, not just from pakistan tax advisors they are not in every project uh, they can be there in some project uh, but they are not there in every project credit committees credit committees is again uh, a completely i would say uh, out of the uh, group term here credit committees essentially are the people within the bank who approve uh, the funding for the project so in that sense they are uh, a stakeholder so credit committee comprises of individuals within a bank who are basically um, who are in charge of giving approval for a particular uh, project whether or not they are comfortable in allowing credit to uh, to that particular project uh, this slide is uh, is essentially a pictorial representation of what I explained in the earlier slide, but I think I'll just touch upon a few points here. So, if you look at this um, stakeholder shareholders, shareholders are the ones who are injecting equity. So, so I mean, it's not a it's not an interactive session. I'm sure there might be lots of questions in your mind. And maybe some of the terms I'm using are not making sense to you guys, depending upon which background you come from. But in very simple language, as I said that uh, project, com as I said that lenders, you know, typically give about 75 to 80 percent of the project cost. So the remaining 25 or 20 percent comes from the shareholders or the sponsors. So we, so, so that is the equity piece uh, in the cost, and that is injected uh, through shareholders. So there's this project company, I can't, I mean, I, I, I know you are seeing the screen, but see in the, in the middle of the screen, there's this project company, which is actually the borrower. The project company is the borrower. And then you have the shareholders on the one end of the spectrum. Then there are lenders and operator. Operator is essentially uh, an entity which uh, is responsible for uh, ensuring smooth operations during the operating period you know there's a construction phase which is the phase where project is being constructed and there is this you know operating phase where the project is operating so uh, the operator is there uh, the off take purchaser the off take the off take purchaser is basically is the one which is uh, which is guaranteeing you uh, to buy which is basically guaranteeing the project company that it will purchase the the product of the company which is which in the case of IPP is energy. So you have an offtake purchaser. In particular, reference with IPP, the offtake purchaser obviously is Government of Pakistan, CPPAG, Central Power Purchasing Agency of Pakistan, who are the power purchase, who are the power purchaser and who uh, sign the power purchase agreement with the lenders. Uh, then we have got input supplier in in obviously in, in typical case of renewable energy, the input supplier is is nature. You are relying on on sun uh, for solar energy, and you're relying on wind for uh, wind power projects. So, in, um, in 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 IPP renewable IPP, the input supplier is nature. Uh, construction contractor, obviously during construction phase, you're dealing with an EPC contractor who is supposed to um, who is supposed to take responsibility to construct the project and hand over the completed project to the project company. So this is this slide, and then we move on to the, the actual topic of today, which is key risk analysis and risk allocation. And this is divided into five um, segments. This section is itself divided into five segments. Okay, <clears throat> so relevance of risk analysis, allocation of risk, result of an allocated risk, uh, favorite words. So, um, I mean, as I said, project financing, um, starting from scratch, there's nothing. So how do you go about it? How do you how do you go about it? And then let me go back a bit. We 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 talked about this slide, right? Uh, so so essentially, what happens is that you know you have got these uh, stakeholders, or you've got these parties, who are all parties to the project. So on the one hand, you have to, you have, you are supposed to, um, you know, you are under an obligation to provide energy to government of Pakistan. Let us discuss in particular reference to IPP so that, you know, we stay focused and we are able to understand a bit better. 
So in an IPP situation, an independent power producer, uh, say a 50 megawatt uh, wind power, power project. So in wind power project, the off taker is government of Pakistan, as I've been saying. So government of Pakistan signs an agreement with the project company, right? So, so, so under that agreement, the project company, which is the borrower, is supposed to uh, is provide energy. Is supposed to provide energy to the uh, to to the government of Pakistan from a certain date. After a certain date, um, the the borrower is uh, obligated to provide certain amount of energy uh, to government of Pakistan. And if the borrower fails to do that, the borrower has to pay liquidated damages. The borrower has to pay penalties in other words they have to pay fine in other words in simple language they have to pay fine so you have this agreement where you know you are being paid if you pay on time you are getting revenue and if you do not pay on time i mean sorry if you if you supply energy on time you're getting revenues and if you do not supply energy on time and if you do not supply on the specifications which are spelled out in the ppa you are supposed to pay fine and uh, you are supposed to pay penalties so to cover so what is so what is the major risk that comes to your mind you have time you have you know certain time period during which you have to ensure that you are able to generate energy and supply it to the power purchaser so how can you cover this risk to cover this risk the project company will enter into an epc contract with some very reputable and uh, a successful EPC contractor. Now, who is an EPC contractor? EPC contractor is a, is a firm which provides services uh, of putting up the entire wind farm. That firm will start construction of the wind farm and complete it from end to end. And for that cost, uh, sorry, that service, they charge a premium. They are supposed to source everyone. So, so the project company is not concerned with contracting, you know, a small um, uh, construction contractor, everything is done by the EPC contractor. So EPC contractor is like a take it you know, the, like, you know, for example, if you want to build your own house and you are not, you do not want to bother yourself with, uh, for example, each detail of the house, you know, what, like, you know, the, you, you approve a design and then you leave it to the to the take it are to build the whole house for you and to hand you over the key so you do not concern yourself with you know what kind of wood you would use you just tell him the uh, you know you give him a specification in form of design so exactly that way epc contractor is supposed to hand over the key of the entire project to the project company and all the headache is of epc contractor and not only that epc contractor is levied with heavy penalties and damages, liquidated damages, if it is not able to complete the project on time, and also if it is not able to complete the project uh, with the efficiency levels and with the performance levels that it has promised in the contract. So EBC contract is a comprehensive document, is a fat document with lots of you know clauses and provisions. Uh, so so how, what is happening now? So you have you have your uh, power purchase agreement with the government where you are supposed to give power and get money. And on the other hand, you have this EPC contract with the EPC contractor who is going to facilitate construction for you, not just facilitate, who is going to actually be primarily responsible for construction. So these two ends are like back to back. So construction contractor is under heavy penalties if it does not complete construction on time. So you are able to, you know, like ring fence this arrangement as far as your obligation to the power purchaser is concerned which is the government of pakistan whom you have to give supply energy to so so there's this contractor naturally contractor is not working for free so you need to pay to the contractor so where the money is coming from so so the money is coming from 80 percent from the lenders and 20 percent from the shareholders of, so there is where the money is coming from right and and then obviously authority um, the regulators are there. So regulators have to give approvals for so many things. For example, NEPRA has to give approval for tariff. Uh, EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency, has to give clearance for environment. And there are so many other you know, approvals which are required from so many other uh, bodies um, at the site or, or for other matters. So, so basically, what, we, what I'm trying to explain here is 
that you 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 allocation of risk i was trying to explain the point allocation of risk for example so you by virtue of bringing on board an epc contractor the lenders and the project company were able to allocate uh, the risk of not being able to provide energy on time onto the APC contractor because he's under heavy penalties. He's getting money for the job. And if it is, he's not able to complete the work on time, he will be paying the damages, which will be going to the power purchaser. So you have insulated yourself. You have kind of insulated yourself from in between because if it doesn't complete on time, then it is going to, the APC contractor is going to be at risk of losing money, which will go to the power purchaser till such time he's able to complete the job. So naturally, you know, risks are kind of, they're kind of crystallized, they're kind of determined on the basis of due diligence and they're all, uh, they're all like allocated. So each risk is, each risk is um, taken care of. So, so the major risks are being taken care of through EPC contracting, um, then, okay. Then move on, if you move on to say, for example, Assume for a minute that project is constructed in time and in the manner uh, it was, uh, you know, specified as, you know, the, of course, the power purchase agreement also has, it's, that also is a very heavy document. It also has a lot of, um, you know, clauses and provisions. So assume for a minute that project is like constructed exactly in the manner it was supposed to be. Uh, so, so are the risks over now? No, no, not really. They're not over. The risks are not over. Uh, the risks are still there. Something may happen during the operating phase. So then what lenders are still exposed to risk because lenders are lending typically the tenor of such transactions. It's not like one, two years. Obviously in one, two years, is the, that is the construction phase. The cash flows start coming in after the construction phase is over. So the repayment period, the repayment of loan period starts at the end of the construction period. So typically the, the repayment period is around 10 years or so. So, um, so, so, so during those 10 years period, anything can happen. The project, obviously there could be a force majeure situation. There could be, you know, a breakdown, a heavy breakdown of machinery. There could be many other things. So to, to ensure that project runs in accordance, you know, with what the off taker wants, uh, O&M contracts, operations and maintenance contracts are also entered into, and they are like long-term contracts. They are like, uh, you know, contracts for 10 years, uh, which typically uh, the O&M contracts mirror the duration of the loan. So, so the O&M contracts focus on the operating period risks. So they, uh, so, so, you know, the operating period risk is passed on to the O&M contractor. The O&M contractor again charges a price, a premium, but at the same time, the O&M contractor ensures that project runs smoothly. Now, one question which could be in your mind is that, okay, everybody's charging a premium to, you know, so, so, so to capture risk, you are paying premium. So where is this premium being funded from? So the premium is actually funded through tariff. The tariff takes care of like, you know, all the component of the cost. Tariff, tariff means the price which, is, which government is willing to pay. So for one, uh, like one kilowatt of energy, if government is willing to pay uh, 3.5 cents or six rupees per kilowatt, for example, for one uh, per kilowatt of energy, that six rupees will be distributed in like, you know, um, it's a 50 megawatt project. So you can do the math. So that, that cost is there, is available eligible cost. And that is going to be uh, distributed uh, to the EPC contractor. So, so cost, all costs are taken care of in tariff and costs which are not uh, covered in tariff, lenders do not fund them. Lenders are not supposed to fund them because if the costs are not covered in tariff and you fund them, then naturally that means that you are swelling the project cost. And if your project cost is swell and, uh, and the revenues are not going to be swelling uh, in line with the project cost swelling, the so revenues are in line with tariff. So if you allow uh, costs which are not allowed in tariff, that means you are allowing hole in project. So that it doesn't work that way. So we restrict ourselves to costs which are allowed in tariff, uh, which are allowed, you know, in, in, in other words, in, in revenue generating capacity of the project. So keeping in mind the revenue generation capacity of the project costs are incurred, not beyond that. So each and every cost, whether there is premium included is in line with the revenue generating capacity or in other words, tariff of the project. Favorite words, back-to-back uh, -back arrangement. Back-to-back -back arrangement, I have just explained one example. I told, told you that there is this power purchase agreement and on back of it, there is EPC contract. So, you know, so this is like back-to-back. -back. So you have 
you are supposed to pay out to someone and on the other hand someone else is supposed to pay to you so you are insulated so i had explained it counterparty risk um, obviously when you are dealing with you know so many stakeholders one of them being primary stakeholder being the epc contractor itself so credit worthiness of the epc contractor obviously is very very important so the so the epc contractor has to be uh, financially robust it has to be uh, you know a, a, a company which has done many projects so the ex experience wise uh, in terms of its technical capacity it has to be a really um, you know a strong uh, company so lenders can take comfort on the fact that you know uh, in, in in challenging circumstances also the apc contractor will not run away from the site it will continue to obviously for if it is a credit worthy company its reputation will matter for it right uh, creation of um, uh, Prima, we credit have a is question, what is epc project what is epc project what is e there is a question from uh, yeah epc okay epc stands for erection procurement and construction epc epc is a term which is used to describe the kind of contracts that we usually uh, enter for the purposes of completing the project constructing the project uh, action which means to to erect something on the ground for to procurement of machinery supply of machinery so epc is a erection procurement and construction contract right so it's an epc contract so so construction contract and project financing are referred to as epc contract so it's actually just a term which is used it's a terminology nomenclature so it's it's, it's a contractor thekedar jo as i was explaining you thekedar hai in in aam zuban wo thekedar hai lekin obviously wo bahut high level ka thekedar hai to ye ye epc contractor hota hai next slide i think we are not left with a lot of time um i mean construction phase is obviously the very sensitive phase construction phase so construction phase you see major risk the major risks are captured in construction phase if the project is constructed in time and on the parameters uh, which were set out for it in the beginning then like it's i mean you were there and you if you are able to complete as i said in time in time which was allowed to you and uh, your efficiency levels and you know your cost especially the cost which was set out for it ki ji itne paise mein ban jayega utne utne mein ban jata hai us time mein ban jata hai un un parameters mein ban jata hai to so you your risk is like 90% covered you know maybe 80% covered theek hai operating period mein bhi aise risks hote hain so uh, so basically so 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 construction phase is very sensitive so during construction completion and commissioning commissioning is jab aap bilkul usko you know start kar dete hain jab wo uh, bijli banana shuru kar dete hain that is commissioning so construction com uh, completion and commissioning risks pe hum typically kya dekhte hain we look at technology and design obviously technology has to be the latest technology but at the same time it doesn't have to be the prototype yani yani like it has to be a proven technology it has to be a functioning technology in the work not a sample technology price if you are going for best technology but it is very very expensive your tariff doesn't allow it that is a no no you can't do it so you have to balance the price and the technology and design together site conditions uh, how the land is land is mushy agar land mushy hai to construction cost zyada hogi because foundation ko concrete foundation ko banane mein obviously you will need more you know uh, like you know you would need uh, solid foundation and uh, more concrete and other things to go in uh, associated infrastructure and ancillary facilities um, uh, this is again uh for for being able to construct the project you need roads there obviously the epc contractor is not going to build roads for you so project site tak to aapko roads chahiye waha waha tak to aapko pani bhi chahiye to wo cheeze to epc contractor nahi provide karega uska kaam to project banana hai to ye sare risk bhi dekhne padte hain transportation ka bhi jo risk hai ki ji labor waha kaise jayega commissioning and testing ke time pe aapko technical log chahiye a variation and change order is a very important term variation basically means change order basically means that something which comes up uh during construction phase which was not initially planned or was thought about something which comes up which was not which is not part of the epc contractor responsibility for example during construction uh the epc contractor realizes uh, that you know um uh, the 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 height of the turbine is is like too much and uh he would need to 
a cut down on the height. So he would have to change the technology and that uh, reduction in height of the turbine is not because of him, it's because of some other factor, something else, something to do maybe with, uh, you know, with the scanning of, uh, with, with the environment where the regulator did not allow for a certain height of turbine to go through at a later stage. And that has actually happened. I mean, we have less time, I can't really delve into details. So these kind of things happen. So what happens when you have to change things unexpectedly in between the construction phase? So naturally, there is a change order, there is a cost. So that's a risk. So this change order ka risk avoid karne ke liye due diligence has to be very, very robust and strong from the beginning. So all angles, these angles also explore karne padte hai, ki ji, construction phase mein koi aisi possibility hai, uh, you know, kisi aise um, 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 situation ki arise honne ki, jo aap aaj kuch nahi soch sakte, but it arises. So permutations bhi jo hai, build karne padte hai. Um, naturally, as I said, that EPC contractor has heavy penalties. If you don't finish the time, you have to performance bond, you have to allow the warranty period, you allow the delay damages. Bhi deta hai. So all sorts of, th those sorts of things are there. Uh, defect liability, again, is, is the warranty period concept. You have to give warranty for two years. If you take a car, you have to give a warranty for two years. Exactly the same way. Cost overruns. Cost overruns obviously are not the responsibility of EBC contractor. If cost overruns, अच्छा okay, cost overruns के होने के भी बहुत सी reasons हैं. Cost overruns could be कि जी आपका interest rate ऊपर चला गया. Kaibor अगर जब आपने lending की तो Kaibor 10% था और छह महीने बाद Kaibor 15% हो गया and you hadn't really foreseen it. आपने जो contingency bill की भी थी 12% की भी थी 10 to 12, but it went up to 15%. So that is a cost overrun. So who would fund it? So lenders ask sponsors to give guarantees. Uh, SBLCs lete hai, financial guarantees lete hai, a certain amount ki due diligence karke ki ji ye jo cost over runs agar hote hai is noyat ke for example dollar ka rate aapne machinery to dollar EPC contractor ko aapne dollar mein pay karna hai to dollar is 160 today uh, during construction phase dollar 200 pe chala gaya so aapne itna budget nahi kiya tha to then you will be you will we take sponsor guarantees construction phase mein limited amount ki guarantee lete hai not unlimited ki ji ek assessment karke so that is uh, that basically is the uh, is the cost over and risk the, the which is uh, of course very very important it's extremely important because cost over and risk ki wajah se there have been projects in Pakistan jo cost over runs ki wajah se completely flat ho gaye jo jo basically uh, you know they just went burst or lenders ka jo bhi paisa tha wo sab doob gaya because itne cost over runs heavy hue and nobody was there to support those cost over runs and those projects went down the drain. So it is such an important thing to assess on day one. Or naturally, jitna lamba tenor hoga construction ka utna ya risk bada hoga. Force majeure is like, you know, unforeseen event. For example, a war. For example, coronavirus is a force, was a force majeure situation just a few months uh, behind. If you look behind in March, April this year, a lot of suppliers, a lot of contractors around the world declared uh, coronavirus as a force majeure. Why? Because they were not, it, it actually disrupted the whole global operations, it disrupted the global supply chain. So force majeure is, is basically an act of war, an act of God, uh, some, some earthquake, something which completely, um, you know, um, unexpectedly disrupts the whole situation. So it's beyond human control. I mean, it's beyond human, possible human control. Uh, so that's a risk. And how do you cover that risk? That's the question. So how, how we cover that risk? Force majeure risks are usually there in, um, like, you know, they, they're, they're covered in contracts by way of uh, allowing extension. Uh, so contracts take care of them, legal, their legal rights, which are related with force majeure of all parties. So those legal rights can be invoked. Now oh, it's again, I mean, I understand it's all jargon. I'm not sure how much you're following me, but legal rights are there in agreements and in, in relation with force majeure. So parties can actually uh, they can invoke their legal rights uh, if they're faced with force majeure. Contractor payments uh, have to be made in, like, you know, they have to be remitted outside of Pakistan. So state bank permissions are involved. Um, and sometimes those permissions can be delayed. And sometimes those permissions can come in, like, you know, they sometimes simply, like, come in really, really late. Uh, so those risks are there. Uh, contractor, because of delay in payment, can stop working. So just trying to give you a flavor of uh, there are so many, on the face of it, it's just simple construction going on, right? You know, you go on a site, you see, okay, when farm is being constructed, you will see turbines being raised, blades, you know, being uh, blades of turbine being uh, uh, refined and all that of stuff. And 
but on the on the back of it there is so much happening there are so many different aspects of it which you know are being tackled by many different people so it's obviously it's a it's a deep topic in, in the sense that i can't possibly cover it in one hour um, um but but i can just give you a flavor so i can just tell you that construction phase is is very critical uh, because if you are able to construct on time and within the cost which is set out in the financial model in the budget and which is in accordance with the tariff the revenue generating capacity it's a job almost done 80% done um uh, moving on moving on to the third segment which is basically the land naturally the land on which you are putting up the project is has to be clean like you know the title of the project has to be clean uh so if the if the land is encumbered if there are other uh if there are you know other um other other parties who are claiming to the land piece then naturally the the project is in trouble so lenders make sure that the title to the land is clean uh lenders make sure that you know the title of the land is transferable to lenders um it, there are no previous charges or claimants of the land operational period market risk operational period market risk is there but obviously it is less important i mean less less complex i must say or maybe um uh, less critical than construction phase market risk operating period market risk is is emanating based on the fact that um um uh, you know as i said that you know for example you are not able to operate the plant because of a uh, certain major back breakdown within the plant you are not able to run the wind farm because uh, you know wind is not there say for example so that is obviously an operational risk and i told you guys that operational risk is tackled through uh, having an onm contractor on board uh, so um, uh, so so essentially wind risk is something wind not being there is something which nobody can do anything about because it's not guaranteed if wind is not there and you can't you know operate the plant and this is this is a risk which is Uh, which which has no coverage but obviously this is a very uh, i must say remote risk because when speed can be you know low and high when could be like you were expecting the wind the study actually suggested that the wind would be really high at a certain period in a year but on the contrary it was low and at other times it was high so it could be high wind season low wind season so you know your plans could differ and alter but having no wind is a very unique situation so i've just giving an example that those sort of risks are there in operating phase and naturally operating phase risks are also covered through insurance so insurances are heavy and they are comprehensive and all aspects of a performance are covered through insurances um all sorts of insurances are there um and a very important one thing which is very very important i think i would um uh, Uh, I, i must cover that i will just take 5 more minutes to conclude the presentation so one of the very important thing is take or pay so the take or pay is you know the the out, the contract the off take contract is based on the principle of take or pay which means what which means that that even if the if the if the purchaser the power purchaser is not buying energy from the wind uh, power project you know power project is lag gaya और वो तैयार है वो बिल्कुल रेडी है वो बिल्कुल परफेक्ट है लेकिन पावर परचेजर जो कि गवर्नमेंट ऑफ पाकिस्तान है वो बिजली नहीं खरीदती अपनी वजह से दे आर स्टिल लायबल टू पे बिकॉज प्रोजेक्ट तो लग गया एंड इफ दे आर नॉट बाइंग इट इज नॉट प्रोजेक्ट कंपनीज फॉल्ट इट इज नॉट लेंडर्स फॉल्ट सो दे विल स्टिल पे सो दैट एक्चुअली इज अ बिग कवरेज फॉर ऑल द कॉस्ट दैट गो इनटू पुटिंग अप द प्रोजेक्ट सो एसेंशियली 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 द टेक और पे इज लाइक यू नो द um the the biggest comfort that lenders take in such projects because if project is there and nobody is ready is willing to buy then why on earth did you put the project there so it is important to have this assurance that if the project is ready up and ready up and running the counterparty which is the buyer of the services of the project or the or the product of the project is going to be there is going to be ready ready to pay whether or not he uses the uh, you know the the out the output or whether or not he uses the services of the project so that is so important so take or pay is the is like one of the fundamental underlying principles on which project financing is done um i'm i'll just quickly cover this force majeure i think i've uh, force majeure risk i've tried to explain the force majeure certain portion of force majeure risk are covered through insurances for example earthquake floods obviously you have insurances for such events war to certain extent war is partially covered 
compensation and reliefs are there in the agreements. A compensation, as I said, certain legal rights are there. So some of those translate into compensation and reliefs from the parties. Political risks are there as well. Political risk is, and they are one of the, you know, they are some of the biggest risks. So political risks are like change in law, changes in uh, law can change. Like, I mean, recently, Jobi Hora, the government ne jo hai, wo, uh, ye view liya hai ki ji, um, jo, um, PPS kiye hai hai, purane power purchases ke saath unko government ab, ab unko basically renegotiate kar rahi hai. But good thing is that in most of those projects, lenders are paid off. So ab wo 10, 10, 12, 12 saal purane projects and lenders are paid off. So that risk is actually not bothering, uh, you know, lenders that much. So these are all the risks that are covered in which you can see a change in taxes and duties and all of that stuff that essentially is the, we, we call them political risk or we sometimes call them legal risks also. This is the last slide and these are some of the, some other risks uh, which are there, which we, which we pay attention to. Um, I think in these risk, exchange rate risk is there, which is important to talk about. Uh, KG, you have project, so it was a dollar, it was 160. When the project construction phase was done, it was a dollar. You have budget, I have spoken about it. So I think this is a major risk. The rest of risk is default risk. If your counterparty default, kar jai, so, I mean, some risks are like that you can't cover any kind of risk. But then you rely on the strength, financial strength, financial muscle, and size of you know, your contractor and your power purchaser. So this is how it is. So um, I'm sorry for the disturbances around me, but I think I'm done for now. Uh, no, Deva, thank you so much. I think your kids seem to enjoy the session too. And I'm really uh, thankful for taking your time out. Uh, we have just one question. Uh, we have some questions, but one question that I would really want to ask is about the hedging process. So uh, there are this natural hedge that we hire the companies and, you know, but is there any financial hedging involved in this or we just rely on the natural hedge uh, through, uh, you know, hiring these companies and stuff? Uh, natural uh, financial hedging is actually, if you talk about hedging from a state bank counter that was disallowed when, you know, the, the current account deficit became uh, very, very huge. And I think since last few years, the state bank is not allowing hedging. So it used to be the case that a state bank used to hedge dollars. Like it used to hedge, in fact, all foreign currency. So it used to allow that foreign currency hedging, which would, which would obviously, uh, to a to a larger degree, curtail the risk um, on of cost overrun. But it is not being allowed since last many years. So, um, so it is. I mean, natural hedging, which you have to rely on. You know, natural hedging in this context could be that you build in contingency in your budget. So, so financial hedging is not not allowed, not permitted by the regulator at the okay, moment. So, okay, right. So we have another question that what ideally, what percentage of total project cost is related to managers, uh, just the risk associated with the project? Uh, I think you are on mute. Yeah. Could you, could you repeat? Avas? I didn't follow the question. Uh, what percentage of total project costs is related to managing just the risk associated with the project like this, you know, uh, the insurance cost, what sort of percentage would it be journally? Okay. Just give me a second. Uh, what percentage would be the project costs which go into in, which go into payment of insurances? That's what you uh, asked. Yeah, and and managing the risk. Managing the risk. Okay, I think uh, it would be about uh, ma managing the risk is actually like inbuilt into all all things that you are doing. So I think if I put it that way, insurance is roughly one percent of the project cost, one to one point five percent at most. So it's not uh, a huge chunk, but if managing risk, I think that would translate somewhere between five to 10% because everybody's charging premium for that extra risk that they're assuming. So that eventually translates into a five to 10% uh, number of the project cost. So, so your costs go up by, you know, 10% between five to 10% if you are like, you know, assigning, if you want people to turn it around for you completely and to, to assume financial responsibility, pay you damages if there is, if there are delays. 
Okay, all right. Um, I think we are done for the day. Uh, Seba, thank you so much for your time. It was a very well uh, and very comprehensively uh, made uh, slides, and you actually went into very basic. So I myself did not have a lot of idea about project financing. So I myself learned a lot. And uh, uh, thank you so much again. We hope to uh, to have another session again with you sometime on probably on other topic. Uh, inshallah. So uh, thank you so much, and uh, look forward to uh, to having such session again with you. Mm, you are most welcome, Avas. I think uh, it was. I hope I was useful to all the participants. I hope I made sense to them, uh, and thank you for inviting me over. Uh, no, I think uh, the feedback we are receiving is pretty good, and the good thing that you actually defined most of these things. Uh, so it was good for the people who didn't have any idea about the project. I think so. I would. I think it was very good. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we hope uh, uh, it was uh, uh, it was a fruitful session for all of you. We will be having such sessions hopefully in the coming week also. We are planning a session on IFRS nine and another on personal branding. So we will keep you updated. Thank you so much.